The waterfront hints at its past through a few unobtrusive industrial relics like these smokestacks and some explanatory signs like this one outside of the Starbucks. These hints remind people of what many of us already know, what the waterfront used to be, which was a giant steel mill, one of the world's largest. No room for empty parking spots here. Every inch of the property was once crammed with the machinery of steel making. But I want to turn back time even further to an earlier identity for this site that has been utterly wiped from the landscape without a trace, not even with any explanatory signage. I want to take you to Homestead in the 1930s. There on the left is how the steel mill complex looked in those years, an L encompassing two sides of a neighborhood that teemed with homes and stores and churches and meeting halls. Notice that the neighborhood fills the area down to the water. This view from 1902, although much earlier, makes it easier for you to visualize how things stood in the 1930s. You can see here again the L-shaped mill on one side, but note that there is another part of the steel mill all the way on the other side of town. You can see more clearly here the two sets of train tracks running through the neighborhood, dividing the flat portion along the river from the hill beyond the tracks. Perhaps this map of Homestead makes it easiest to see. Here on the sides are the steel mill and this 121 acre region in the middle, bounded by the steel mill on two sides, the river to the north, the double train tracks to the south is the neighborhood we call the ward. You can see from this map that back in the 1930s, the steel mill had an obvious problem. They had two properties a mile apart that they couldn't connect. They had tried twice before, most recently in 1932 to buy up the property, but they failed. To quote wartime propaganda from later, quote, the mill workers' homes were close to the mills and sandwiched in between parts of the mills from the river to the railroad tracks. Efforts to buy adjoining properties failed. The company had given up hope of ever joining its two mill sections because owners demanded prohibitive land prices. In other words, the neighborhood was in the way. In other words, the mill workers' homes blocked progress. In 1941, the steel mill got a very powerful partner to advance its ambitions. That partner was the federal government. The year before, shortly after war broke out in Europe, but well before the US entered that war, the federal government was considering how to expand its defensive capabilities and produce war material to sell to Britain. The federal government decided to fund the construction of plants to produce military equipment. A key part of that plan was to create a public-private partnership that set up a framework through which the federal government would fund the expansion of existing industrial companies so that the companies wouldn't need to make the investment themselves or take on any risk. In the midst of the formulation of these plans, President Roosevelt visited Homestead in October 1940, both as part of his presidential campaign and, in his words, to look over projects that have a great deal to do with national defense. There was tremendous excitement in Homestead over his visit, but no one recognized what it portended. Six months later, in April 1941, the news began to break that the Homestead Works was under consideration for expansion through this public-private partnership. And on June 30th, 1941, the news was announced as certain. $75 million was allocated to expand the Homestead Works, with U.S. Steel having to pay only one quarter of the costs. This is how the destruction of the word is usually framed. Defense, steel, industry. But US Steel and the federal government were well aware that this project would require demolishing a neighborhood and displacing thousands of people. In fact, about 10% of the original budget of the project included the cost of purchasing people's properties. But the residents of Homestead did not have a voice or a choice in this decision. Can you imagine being a resident of the ward reading this headline 80 years ago? This is how they learned what was going to happen. There were no public meetings or community gatherings. Their homes had been repeatedly canvassed throughout the spring, so they knew what had been brewing, but this was not a project that involved community feedback. The story that I wanna tell you today is about these people. Who were they? What was their neighborhood? And here's something that you talk about when they talk about the ward. What happened to them when they lost their homes? And what can we learn from that? Let me start with some demographics. 
There were about 7 to 8,000 people living in the ward and about 1,500 families. 20% of them were foreign born, mostly from Central or Eastern Europe. Most of the rest of the white people were second or third generation in immigrant families. 20 to 25% of the residents were black. Uh, infiltrating blacks is the terminology that was used by the real estate agents. The better off black families had been in homestead dating to the late 1800s, but there were a lot more recent arrivals who came with the great migration and were struggling economically. The blacks in the ward comprised 80% of the total number of black residents in homestead. 80% uh, of the people who lived in the ward were renters. This will be critical to our story. And 20% of the people received some form of government assistance. The residents of the ward largely comprised the unskilled and semi-skilled employees of Carnegie Steel, but these jobs were not equally distributed. 70% of white families were steel families, but just 48% of black families were, and this difference will also be critical to the story. People largely lived in crowded houses, whether multifamily homes, single family homes with renters, or large boarding houses. Families had a lot of children. It was the most crowded district in the whole of Allegheny County. The public perception of the ward was that it was one big slum. The numbers from a WPA survey taken in May 1941 do suggest that most people were then living in concerning conditions. 84% of the homes they classed as substandard, 9% they classed as unfit for use. 90% had no central heating, 70% had no bathtub or shower, one third had no indoor toilet. But some people's slum is also another person's ethnic enclave. The toughest parts of the ward came to define the whole, but there was a lot more to the community than the stats to which the WPA had reduced the community on the eve of its destruction. The ward was actually a patchwork of sections for people from different backgrounds. Some were residential only, some were mixed residential and commercial, some were quite impoverished, and some were more established. For non steel workers, there was a culture of entrepreneurism on which the whole community depended. Lots of small family run groceries, meat markets, and confectionaries that catered to the distinct tastes of its different populations. All the way in the back of the picture of the street of Dixon Street, you can just make out a sign for Hep's Pharmacy, my family's business. Shopkeepers like my family lived above or behind their stores and worked long hours. Communal life centered around churches and ethnic-based organizations. There were 11 churches in the ward, three ethnic Catholic churches that had schools and convents attached. Uh, there was a Russian Orthodox Greek Catholic church, and there was one established black church, Second Baptist, and many small storefront churches that catered to the newer black community. Connected to and apart from the churches were numerous clubs and organizations. There were a few ethnic meeting halls, there were a couple settlement houses with playgrounds, one for white residents and another one for black. And there was a public school. The other names that people called the ward, down below, the bottoms, reflect both the way it was perceived as well as its literal geography. That geography tracked the smoke and soot from the mills in the neighborhood. It was older, dirtier, noisier, and more congested. It had higher crime, it was poor and less educated, and as I discussed at the outset, it was more diverse. Uh, the ward was also famous for its vice, gambling, prostitution, saloons. The vice was widespread, well-established, and mostly overlooked by the authorities who'd been paid off to overlook it. All of this made the ward culturally distinct from the rest of Homestead, its own little world. To the people who lived there white and black, it was an enclave, a world in which they had figured out how to be themselves and coexist, however imperfectly. They gained some comfort in their close living conditions. They shared an identity of being from down below. Working at the mill united many of the families in a shared struggle and shared objectives. They enjoyed the same entertainments and gathering places, even the more sordid ones. Children played together across ethnic and racial lines. It was an old community with deep relationships and lifelong associations. The residents of the ward lived a way of life that meant something to them, but to outsiders, it was a problem that needed to be fixed. So this redlining map from July of 1937 put the neighborhood, the ward, all in red. The ward was considered undesirable property by real estate agents and bankers, property that had one thing going for it. 
Good possibility of ground between river and railroad being purchased by industry. The government therefore believed that the destruction of the ward would be a welcome project of slum clearance, a blessing for people living in a rundown area. After all, to the government, it was just ground. Ground whose industrial destiny had slipped out of US Steel's grasp twice before. The patriotic mandate of national defense plus the beneficent cover of slum clearance was too potent a combination to fail. All that said, it was probably inevitable. Homestead had been the country's leading producer of armor plate since Carnegie made it so by 1890. And when the government renewed its shipbuilding efforts in 1939 after an almost two decade hiatus, there were only three American companies who had the know-how to fill the now giant need for armor plate and all three received significant federal funding. When it came to actually affecting the expansion, the people of the ward might have been in the way of progress, but it actually turned out that dealing with the people was the only way towards progress. First, people had to be convinced to sell their property. Yes, the property could be seized, but that was a last resort. Second, the people who were losing their homes had to be rehoused somewhere. And with a 1% housing vacancy in the region, which drops to 0.4% in Homestead itself, there wasn't actually anywhere for them to go, except that somehow most of them needed to remain near the mill to operate it. And finally, throughout the tremendous sacrifice that was being asked of people, they had to ensure that people actually went along with what was happening to them. So let's now delve into each one of these issues in turn. The property owners, it seemed at the outset, were mainly who the steel mill was up against. The steel mill needed to acquire their property as quickly as possible to proceed. Knowing the history of failed acquisitions in the past, the steel mill's real estate agents began aggressively. When property owners asked for high prices, after all, U.S. Steel was a rich company that stood to make millions, if not billions of dollars off of this federal investment. The real estate agents then spun a fiction that if the property owners remained unreasonable, not only would the steel mill expansion go to Duquesne, another town down the river, but the company would in fact shut down the homestead works entirely. As you can see from these headlines, throughout the spring, the narrative was that the town's fate rested in the hands of a small number of selfish property owners. Either there would be prosperity for all, or the property owners themselves would render Homestead a, quote, ghost town, in the words of the newspaper. Anyway, there really was no negotiating. The agents reminded the property owners that if they didn't accept reasonable offers, their properties would be seized anyway through condemnation proceedings. The property owners were a much more diverse group than you might think with varied interests. 20% of them were residents of the ward, the people we spoke about earlier who owned their own homes or businesses. 80% of them were landlords who mostly did not live in Lower Homestead if they lived in Homestead at all. And there were also many organizations who owned property, primarily churches and the borough itself. The first sale of property from a resident made the front page of the newspaper on July 31st, 1941. Here are Walter Boroskis, a steel worker, and his wife, Agnes. They were Lithuanian immigrants and churchgoers. They were exemplars of the best kind of ward residents. It turns out there were actually earlier sales from those so-called recalcitrant property owners who lived outside of the ward, but no one cared to publicize that. The Boroskis is made for much better propaganda. The organizations that I mentioned earlier split in how they handle their property sales. The churches quickly and publicly agreed to sell their property and find new locations, which was important for reasons I'll note later. The Black storefront churches, however, unlike the churches that are listed here on this slide, did not survive. Ironically, it was the borough's school board and the borough itself who did everything that everyone else was exhorting the other property owners not to do. The borough and its school board were the owners of the streets and alleys, sewers, gas and water lines, the First Ward Elementary School, an engine house, a wharf, the waterworks, and several vacant lots. They put up a fight for as much money as they could get, arguing that it was in the financial interest of the borough. They were also saying at the same time that getting the expansion was also in the financial interest of the borough. 
That said, it took until February 1942, as you'll see almost at the end of this timeline here, for the borough and the steel mill to come to an agreement. And in the meantime, because the US was now actually at war after Pearl Harbor, the borough had to settle for a lot less than an earlier offer that they had rejected. November saw the beginning of condemnation proceedings against the small number of property owners who had not yet sold, with the exception, of course, of the borough and school board who were permitted to continue to negotiate. Some property owners relented at this late hour, but six properties were in fact condemned in March of 1942, mostly from property owners outside of the ward. At the time, people felt that they got fair prices. They certainly had to say so publicly, but good housing prices for a doomed district of Homestead did not translate to housing prices in other areas of a city that was on the brink of an industrial boom for, with the war. And so with housing and rent prices skyrocketing, even some of the lucky people who got money out of the destruction still had challenges reestablishing their homes and their businesses elsewhere. Acquiring the property actually turned out to be far more straightforward than removing the residents themselves. Many of the renters who obviously got no money for property sales had nowhere to go. Just one third of the people who lost their homes found their own housing arrangements. Some moved in with family and nearby, they gave up on the housing market. Others did manage to buy or rent new homes. But two thirds of the homestead evacuees ended up in public housing projects only one of which was even open when the mill expansion was announced. Of the two closest projects to the ward, um, and therefore to the steel mill where most of these people were employed, uh, ground was broken on Glen Hazel Heights on June 3rd and Mono Homesteads July 23rd. And for context, remember that people had been hearing since April that they were going to be homeless, and it was confirmed on June 30th. They were initially told that public housing would be ready for them by September 15th. They were even told that in the meantime, they might be put in trailers for the summer so that demolition could start even before this public housing was ready. In the end, the schedule of demolition had to conform to the actual amount of time it took to rehouse people properly. Uh, these uh, uh, sites that you see here are the four main housing projects that took in homestead evacuees, though there were others further afield that took in some people as well towards the end of this timeline. The projects break down into a couple categories worth exploring. First, three of these projects, as you can see noted here, were for defense workers only. This meant that 30% of white families and the majority of homesteads black residents were not eligible to live there. The one low income project that could take some of them was in the Hill District, which was six miles from Homestead, an expensive distance for people commuting to the steel mill. Second, two of these projects were for whites only. The closest project, Munhall Homesteads, was white only. The reason given was to match the demographics of the almost all white Munhall borough in which it was situated. Nevertheless, Homestead Borough was adamantly opposed to having a project at all. When the Housing Authority acquired the land through condemnation proceedings and broke ground anyway, Munhall refused to provide public services to the project like sewerage, police, fire, garbage, and lights. They took the Housing Authority to court over the project to try to block it, and they lost. It was clear to the Black community fairly early in June that not enough spots were being allocated for evacuees from their community, though their focus was particularly on fair treatment for those Blacks in defense work. They pushed all summer and into the fall. The head of the Allegheny County Housing Authority, who was handling the defense projects, responded to their efforts by trying to blackmail them into submission. He insisted that Black people should receive public housing by the percentage of their numbers in the overall county, not by their much higher percentage in the actual pool of applicants. He asserted that if the Black community would agree to segregation, he'd waive the rules that he made and give them a greater share of public housing. But the Black community did not want to sanction segregated housing and set that kind of precedent. They raised the issue with the federal authorities in Washington and Washington sided with them, but it was too late. All of the homes and the most desirable Munhall Homesteads project had already been assigned to white people. Riverview Houses was integrated though, and that was their victory. 
You'll note from this map that there was no project in Homestead proper. Homestead had a chance to get a low-income project in 1937, but they passed it up. Suddenly, four years later, faced with the political and business ramifications of losing almost half their residents, they decided in the summer that now they wanted one, but it was too late. There was no more funding to be had. None of this housing was ready soon enough. And based on the original categories, it wasn't enough to house the full range of homestead evacuees. And so over the coming months, a number of solutions had to be put in place. First of all, low income projects like Ter Terrace Village 2 in the Hill were converted into defense housing for the duration of the war. Second, they decided to class all demolition victims as defense workers, regardless of their actual employment, so that all the defense housing projects would be available to them. Some of the pressure for these solutions seems to have come from the mill itself as the housing crisis dragged on and delayed the expansion project. For homesteaders, the summer and the fall of 1941 were defined by running around trying to find new homes. They had to apply in separate processes in separate locations for low income versus defense housing until finally the whole process was consolidated in one space in St. Anne's. A homes registration office was opened on 4th Avenue to serve as a clearinghouse for information on local rental options, but there were few registrants because as they already knew, there were very few rental options. There are stories of fathers running around looking for housing and coming back every day dejected. There are stories of people looking at what little property was available and finding it subpar even compared to the standards of the ward. Meanwhile, the date for completing local defense projects got pushed back from September 15th uh, to October 15th. It actually ended up being November that Munhall Homesteads took in its first residence and not till February of 1942 that Glen Hazel took in its first residence. All that summer and fall, the residents heard that this deal well first wouldn't wait for them to leave, then they would wait, then they wouldn't, then they would. Um, in September, people started reading, uh, receiving eviction notices, but those no notices uh, expired. Hundreds of families were still there and they were left there for the time being. Ultimately, the steel mill in response to all of this had to change from a plan of de demolition by whole areas to a house by house demolition. In October, they began to put marks, chalk marks, X's on the homes that were ready for demolition. Demolition started at last on October 24th when a critical mass of properties were so marked. Uh, this video, uh, courtesy of Chuck Half, whose father helmed Half Brothers Department Store, shows the demolition in progress and what Homestead looked like when the area was mostly but not entirely demolished. As houses started coming down, people were told, were told that they must be, quote, out of the doomed area within the next few weeks. They still had nowhere to go, and this is when the housing authorities began to relax some of their policies to find a way of getting people out. As homes were vacated, squatters moved in. There was almost no police presence. Arson and vandalism became rampant. Some people, instead of buying coal for the winter, just tore wood off their neighbors' former homes. People who left for low-income projects had to leave their dogs behind. A growing number of hungry dogs were roaming the streets of the ward. As of early December, only a third of the families had moved. Some of the remaining families had places to go that weren't yet ready. And a lot of the remaining people were black people who couldn't afford to find anywhere to go. People spent Thanksgiving and Christmas in homes that could be taken from them at any moment, watching their neighborhood being raised around them. Pearl Harbor on December 7th meant that the country was now actively at war, not just preparing for the possibility of one. It forced parties on all sides to find solutions to the housing situation. No one wanted to be accused of being unpatriotic. So more policies were relaxed. It was becoming urgent to unblock demolition at this point. But come January, there were still 500 families living in the ward. People were offered homes and housing projects all around the county, not particularly close to Homestead. And they were given 72 hours to accept these homes or face eviction. Of course, white families were offered spots first. Some businesses were still running at this time. The sheriff was called on them. The pipes burst in January, both because of a deep freeze and because records, wreckers had accidentally cut some of them. The borough was deliberately slow in restoring the water to try to force people out. 
people set fires to force the burrow to turn the water back on. February, more housing policies were relaxed in desperation. The black community finally got what they wanted with the percentage of properties going to the actual applicants and not the overall demographics. Glen Hazel finally opened, taking in defense workers who had been lucky to get a spot, although let's consider they had been trapped in these degrading conditions all winter. Eventually, the last group of remaining people who were mostly relief recipients were sent to low income housing in Rankin. Come March, they were evacuating the last families. One property owner who had sold but refused to leave, US Marshals had to evict him. He was in fact in such despair that he threatened to shoot it out with the Marshals. This was his home. He was responsible for his wife, for his young children and his aged parents. He wouldn't leave because even with the money from the sale, he couldn't find affordable housing for him and his family. The last families were out at the end of March of 1942. It took nine months. 8,000 people, 1,500 families were gone. More than 1,300 buildings were in the completion of being raised. What you can't see is that the fabric of the community was torn asunder. It was a diverse community that had learned to coexist, however imperfectly, and now they were spread across the region into intentionally more homogenous settings. People who had figured out ways of getting by, they lost their toehold. A whole community was unraveled, networks of interdependence, ways of identifying and belonging. There was a spate of deaths of older people. Could the months of the housing crisis been avoided? The federal government had identified in 1940 that housing would be the bottleneck to defense, but it took time to get agencies and funding in place. The mismatch in schedules between the mill and the housing authorities created crisis after crisis, but with everything moving so quickly, the lack of coordination between groups at every level of the government, including some with quite recent mandates, perhaps there was no better way to have rolled out this solution. That said, the fly by the seat of your pants bureaucracy along the way created instability and terror for so many evacuees, most of all for the black residents whose numbers in news were repeatedly denied until the very last moment. The last question that I want to address is why people went along with all of this. Some of these answers you heard along the way, people believed they were up against the federal government, not the corporation, and these were people who loved FDR and the New Deal. This issue was aggressively framed from the beginning, as you saw from the newspaper, as comply or condemn all of Homestead forever. Property owners who were otherwise considered powerful elites were precluded from resisting. If anything, they actually went overboard in organizing meetings to prove that they would comply. And the churches, which were very powerful in this community, they complied early and eagerly, and they set the tone for everyone else. Within the white community, there was no tradition of social activism at this time. The non-union era had forced quiescence, and though the mill was unionized well before 41, the union and its members were far from learning how to use their power. The union, in fact, supported the mill expansion because it promised many new jobs and more stability for the existing jobs. And most of the rank and file supported the expansion for the same reason, even if it meant personal sacrifice. They, of course, were privileged to get better defense housing along the way. As we reviewed, the only real organizing came from the Black community, and that is because on account of having fewer defense workers, more poverty, and well, being Black in America, no one was properly attending to their needs. All of the concessions that they won came when members of their community were still trapped in the ward as it was being demolished. That's what pushed it to the brink. Most acts of resistance, if you want to call them that, were individual acts. Largely people who refused to accept what was happening, perhaps refused to accept what lodgings were available. Those people who held out for something better actually ended up with something much worse than they would have gotten. It's in the story of the housing projects where we begin to see more activism, as though people were willing to sacrifice in the name of patriotism and jobs, but no more. The residents self-organized and protested about electric bills, rent bills, paving, landscaping, buses, and bus shelters. In this video, also taken uh, by Chuck Huff's, Chuck Huff's father of the newly built Munhall homesteads, you can see why they complained about the lack of landscaping and the muddy unpaved roads. Perhaps such protests were the result of pent-up frustration it was finally safe to share. I see in the history of the destruction of the ward opposing lessons. 
First, the defining patriotism and civic virtue of bygone times, where people really did seem willing to sacrifice and pull together for the common good. This whitewashes much, both literally and figuratively, but that generation had a spirit we can learn from. There's no denying it. That said, the destruction of the ward set a precedent in this region that we are still trying to buck. Pittsburgh's, the county's subsequent history and present is fraught with examples of outsiders deciding what is the greater good and who must make sacrifices and who gets to gain. It took until July of 1943 for the new part of the mill to begin producing steel. If you compare that to a 13 month contemporaneous project to build a new, albeit smaller steel mill from scratch in California, we can see that the time that was evolved in acquiring the properties, relocating residents and raising the properties created significant delays. That said in the end, the Homestead Works contributed 20% of the overall increase in steel production that the country needed in World War II. During the war, the expanded mill required 10,000 more workers, twice as many as before. And the following decades were a golden era for the mill. And thanks to the union, its workers were finally able to share in that prosperity. In the end, it cost $124 million to expand the steel mill. After the war, US Steel had to pay only $12 million to the federal government to acquire the expansion outright. The borough, who thought that the expansion of the steel mill would mean so much in property taxes for them, went through years of legal battles to try to actually get their fair share of taxes from the steel mill, who lowered the appraisals of their property to try to lower their taxes. When the government battled with the borough over the cost of the borough property, a government, this was that fight I was explaining from uh, late 1941 into early 1942. During that process, a government representative declared, I don't believe this plant will be demolished in the lifetime of any man here. Of course, people alive at that time, even some who were middle-aged when the word was raised, lived to see what no person believed possible in 1941. The mill shut down in the 80s and was raised in the early 90s. Once more, Lower Homestead lay bare until developers came in to build the waterfront shopping complex that we saw pictured at the beginning of this talk. A final legacy of the destruction of the ward is that the fate of the land was removed even further from the actual residents and officials of Homestead. It remains a part of Homestead, and yet it's set apart even more than ever before. The waterfront contains stories layered on stories. Today, I dropped us into the events of 1941 and for early 42, but you can go back to the strike in 1892 or the formation of the town out of farmland in 1871 or further back still to the Native American residents who were displaced by the first farmers. Early settlers remembered their burial mounds dotting the, dotting the landscape. Those burial mounds are all gone now. We like to think that our memory is sufficient to remember the past, but it's not. Transforming a landscape is incredibly powerful and destructive to memory. Memory needs something to hook onto to survive. And when the people who can testify to the past pass away without visual minders for us of what was, people simply cannot continue to transmit what was. I routinely shock even Pittsburghers when I tell them about the destruction of the ward. They didn't know that there used to be a community there, but you'd be surprised at the number of people I meet who don't even know that the waterfront used to be a mill. I wanted to honor the 80th anniversary of the destruction of the ward, not only because it was a seminal event in Homestead's history, but because today we urgently need to reclaim it from the dump of forgotten history. The destruction of the ward speaks to us about what is the greater good and who gets a say in that and why. When I pulled this talk together, my mind kept springing off in so many directions. The redevelopment of the hill, the gentrification of East Liberty, the shellcracker plant in Beaver County, the fate of Clareton Works. The challenges we face in our communities are not new ones. Then and now forces outside of our communities shape a future for people without the input of those people. When we reclaim the destruction of the ward as part of Homestead's canonical history, we center the stories of the lives of those people and we demand specificity for forces we otherwise permit to remain anonymous, the government, the steel mill, the politicians. 
When we center the meaning of the destruction of the ward, our meaning for it, based on the lived experiences of the thousands of people whose lives were disrupted, and not the civic and patriotic messages that were suitable for the wartime conditions of the 40s, then we can learn from it. We could consider the relationship between people and industry and government from a safe distance that can inform to us today and how we advocate for our own interests in the interests of our communities. It's remarkable sometimes how much the present resembles the past, despite all our technological advancements. We need to learn from our past to keep from repeating it. The history that we don't tell ourselves is history that we can't learn from. So I'm honored now to turn it over to a couple of respondents who will do that work of tying together the threads of the past to the present. I've already learned so much from them in our conversations leading up to tonight. And I'll now start by handing it over to Lloyd Cunningham who can speak so much to Homestead Borough as, as it operates and exists today. Thank you. Thank you, that's an extremely difficult act to follow. Um, the redemolition of the population of the wards started in the 1980s as U.S. Steel was making offers of continued good employment to the tradespeople if they would relocate to other U.S. Steel plants, Chicago, Philadelphia, Atlanta, California, and even Poland. Families with little means to leave stayed and had to adjust to lower incomes and having second jobs. The entire Pittsburgh region in the 80s to the early 90s lost 40% of the workforce, uh, leading to the establishment of the Steelers Nation, which is a whole nother story. There's left a hole in the demographics of the generation still to come. There's a lack of homegrown leadership for our churches, community service agencies, uh, boroughs, schools. Uh, for examples, the school district's long-term planning done in the 80s leaves us today with space for 3,000 students projected enrollment from that time. And today there's an enrollment of 1,450 with a projected further loss of 200. The boroughs have 80 plus year old mayors and 70 plus year old council members demonstrating this missing generation that should be filling these roles. And the income loss led to the need for more social services such as Rainbow Kitchen and less owner occupied and more abandoned or rental housing. The redemolition of the ward happened again as U.S. Steel ran out of town, selling the property to a scrapper, the Park Corporation, to ensure the community efforts to reopen any portions of the mills could not happen. The reimagining of the wards had many faces. A decade and a half of ideas were vetted, beginning with a design share charrette led by Prince Charles and David Lewis and then researching and vetting of proposals for a trash to energy electric generating plant, a dog racing track, a housing project, mini mills, and finally a shopping mall. In 1995, Park Corporation partnered with Continental Development of Columbus, Ohio, and serious talks began. A tax sharing tool, a TIF, tax incremented financing, was negotiated with the county, the school board, and the three boroughs to finance the infrastructure, the roads, sewers, street lights, et cetera, that guaranteed each of the taxing authorities would have an annual base tax for the first 20 years, giving everyone more tax revenue than a vacant brownfield provided. And the three boroughs began a negotiating committee to bring the redevelopment of this property to have some results that considered the needs of the communities on both sides of the tracks. The three borough planning commissions met together for the first time probably in history and came to a joint waterfront zoning code that applied equally across the entire space. This took away the advantages or the bickering of pitting one town against another or construction here instead of there for a better deal. All the construction requirements were uniform down to the waterfront green paint that you see everywhere. It's the color of the waterfront and uniform signage being required across the development so that one piece in Munhall looks the same and feels the same as one piece in Homestead. The planning led to negotiations. Continental took exception to some of the requirements 
that the new planning code laid out, uh, street layout, masonry construction. The towns didn't want cheap construction and didn't want Vegas. We limited the size and the quantity of signs and advertising. And a local and very renowned architect, a friend of us all, David Lewis, acquired access to studies that Disney had commissioned for the building of Celebration Village, a planned community that they were developing in Florida. Using parts of Disney's research, the town center concept was added to the plans to replace, replicate a small business downtown. Uh, Disney's research showed that a town with a town square had 150 years plus of viability. A shopping mall had a 25 year lifetime of viability. So the town square adds viability to the district in the US and around the world. And all the streets in the waterfront are aligned with the streets in the towns. If the railroad tracks were removed, the two districts would meld right together. With many heated discussions with Frank Cass, the president of Continental Real Estate, where he declared one day he'd walk away and he stood up and started out the door. And I responded to him that we had now crafted such a good master plan, someone else would come in and build it. And he sat back down. On October 28, 1998, ground was broken for the waterfront. And then as businesses were recruited and signed on to build or lease, the plans were followed, the development was built with many bumps along the way for locations of buildings, housing, green space, historical artifacts, walking trails, everything along the way. And it all led to the successful development that's still successful today. In 2018, the TIF that was crafted in 1998 was completed and the full tax values came to the towns, county and school district, which gives them all more financial stability to the, our valley into the future. Uh, a little aside here on the waterfront, the pump house ownership was fought for and negotiated by the original Battle of Homestead Foundation, the pump house gang, who saved it and preserved it. And we all owe them a great debt of flanks. And now the Allegheny Passage was envisioned and it was negotiated as parts of the rails to trails that were going on at the same time we were negotiating for the waterfront and it got added to the riverfront trail. Regenerating our side of the tracks, we now have many abandoned churches which need to be repurchased, repurposed. Um, St. Mary's Church, very prominent in town, now houses the Dragon's Den, a climbing challenge. Um, Fraternal lodges and high schools now are soon to be open as apartments. Business owners on 8th Avenue have banded together, forming the Avenues Group to collectively mark events. The Still Valley Enterprise Zone became uh, in business and they award low interest loans for development. And the Borough Code Enforcement has been energized into enforcing all the codes equally across the business and housing sectors. This protects the values and investments of all the building owners. And it's led to much less, a much better looking town, much cleaner, much less blight. New businesses literally have been tracked down. We go out and entice them into investing in town. If it's in the newspaper that someone wants to expand, someone from here will be there talking to them. And both the businesses and the residential districts. There's ongoing events to attract people to town. The theory is come to Homestead and have a good time. You'll come back another day. We have um, first Fridays before the pandemic, uh, cultural events were across the business districts the first Friday of each month for six months. And we have ongoing events to attract people. Um, there's an October beer festival, wrestling matches, concerts organized underneath the Homestead Grays Bridge, a space that no one would have ever in imagined as a entertainment venue. And all of you now are invited to the next two projects. Come to town, have a good time, come back another day. Uh, Open Doors Homestead will be across all three towns on June 26th. And for all under the bridge, a wrestling match, which is more comedy show, will happen under the Homestead Grays Bridge on July 17th. And links to all these things should be appearing in the chat room and you can all participate. Now I'd like to pass it on to Curtis, Curtis Reeve of 
Braddock and a great project in McKeesport. Have to unmute Curtis. Yep, I got you. Thank you, uh, Lloyd. I appreciate that. Um, Tess, can we start with the first image that I have? One second, but I got you, Curtis. Okay. I, I wanted to, to start um, the conversation. Um, this is an image of my mom. And um, I was just thinking about Tammy's um, lecture and what my mom was actually walking into when she migrated here from North Carolina. And, um, you know, before she met my father, um, she was an entrepreneur. She tried to, you know, a lot of women that, that migrated from the South during that time were day workers. Uh, my mother could not do day work. Uh, and, and she was just uh, something that did, she did not agree with. And um, she became an entrepreneur. And this photograph is a teeny Harris photograph uh, of my mother protesting uh, because they would not hire uh, African American women as as counter clerks, and um, you know, there's a lot of life lessons that she left behind, um, just in the struggles of life, and my father left behind because um, my father was someone uh, who grew up in Braddock. He was born and raised in Braddock. And it's interesting, he worked for the Housing Authority when they built Talbert Towers, uh, which was a, um, a housing complex near the river, uh, near the Edgar Thompson plant, which if you would go down there today, it's now a hydrogen plant. So a lot of people were displaced um, in that whole um, issue also. Um, but what I would like to talk to you about today is, is a project that me and my wife are currently working on. Um, it's called See Clear. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a project, and can you go one more? I'm, I'm sorry. Um, this is a project that once I got married and, and me and my wife, we had similar dreams. Uh, her background is in marketing, in advertising, in sales, and my, my background is in media and photography. And so we have blended those two things to create See Clear. And we are, can you go to the next one, please? Uh, we are a nonprofit. Um, in the city of McKeesport, uh, we have a space right now that we're remodeling. And our, our whole mission is to really empower economic disadvantaged youth and adults and helping them reach their true potential. And that's what's really, uh, Lloyd touched upon that uh, in, in his talk also, that's what's really needed in our communities today. And so me and Tracy, we're taking a stand in our community and we're gonna make a difference. We, our plans, next please. Um, our plans are to renovate uh, this building, uh, which we own in McKeesport. It's a historic building. Um, and we're gonna have uh, right now in McKeesport, there's only one place where you can get a cup of coffee. And uh, we're going to have a coffee house on the left-hand side of our storefront called Urban Java, which you will see a slide later on. It's going to be a youth barista program. Not everybody is into the arts and technology, but we want to offer a variety of services uh, to the community of McKeesport. So we're really excited uh, about this project and the things that we've already started. Um, next slide, please. 
this is some of the uh, capital improvements that we've made to the building. As you know, building our building was built in the 1890s. Um, we're putting in new windows. We're putting in new new doors. Uh, we're basically next slide, please. The we're we're basically taking something um, that was um, discarded, and we're refurbishing this place. That's going to be a, a, a beacon for the community. And and it's like I said before, I look back on my mother and the people of that generation. They had unity. Unity is pivotal and key to, to us growing together in these blighted communities in the Mon Valley. And so uh, me and my wife, we're taking a stand. Uh, you, as you can see the image on the right, I'm cleaning that brick to bring it back. I want people, you know, a, a, a lot of times people in the Mon Valley, we don't go. A lot of times people don't go anywhere. They don't venture outside of their community. So I'm trying to bring that atmosphere to McKeesport. I'm trying to give people a different outlook in, in a way that we can creatively think and build a better community. Next slide, please. I talked briefly about Urban Java. Urban Java is, is, is a coffee house um, that we're going to have. They're across the street from our building. There's probably 150 cars parked there, people coming in for different services in McKeesport. But besides Eaton Park, there's nowhere you can have conversation in a cup of coffee. So we're going to have a youth barista program there where we're able to, to raise up a generation of, of young people. Not only can they work at Urban Java for us, but they could also go to other coffee houses and earn a de decent wage also. Um, so those are um, some of the things that we're doing uh, with the one side of our space. Next, please. And so far, this is what we uh, see clear, um, what uh, we've had, uh, the impact that we've had so far since 2003. Um, I've serviced over... Um, 200 youth between the ages of 10 and 18. I've done residencies across the city. I've done things in the Mont Valley, Propel Schools, where I've taught photography and um, entrepreneurialism. Um, and also my wife, she's helped two, uh, um, uh, 10 new startup businesses. Uh, some of them were nonprofits. Some of them were for-profit businesses and it's customized one-on-one -on -one coaching. Everybody needs something different. Everybody needs um, a different push in a different direction that they need to go in. So we're helping people along the way, and it's more of a holistic approach to uh, uh, building up our, our entrepreneurism and things like that within our community. Next, please. This are some of the images that um, I of kids. I, I, I like uh, the image on the top left. You know, I was asking children about the civil rights movement, and they really didn't have a clear understanding of the people that fought and died in the civil rights movement. So I turned that into a photographic series where I actually projected those images onto the youth, and we photographed each other uh, with those images. I did this, the series, the image underneath that is from Propel Schools, where uh, kids don't have an opportunity to travel. This young girl said that she would go to the Serengeti. And, and, and so we projected the Serengeti on her to show her that there's a different reality. There's a different, there's a different outlook that you can have on life. And those are the things that our children need. We need to, to, to plant the seed in our children. The image on top was a partnership that I did with Carnegie Mellon with the Gigapan. It's a, it's a robot that they took and sent to Mars. You could shoot like a thousand image 
images and then put the images together, stitch all the images together, and then you can zoom in from a mile away on different things. It's really cool technology. And next slide, please. Um, so those are some of the things that we've done. We've, of course, multimedia arts. That's something that I have a major passion for. And it's important right now with all of the things that are going on in the world that we give our kids a voice. They need to understand. They have a great understanding of social media and, and things like that. But it's, it's also taking it a step further. And, and so uh, we're going to have 3D uh, printing. Um, I'm going to show people how to edit, coding, all of those different things that you can blend together um, that are all transferable skills. And then young people can have, when they go to college, they, have a, uh, they can run into college instead of crawling out. Um, and, and again, my wife, she's doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with entrepreneurs. Next, please. And, and uh, this is the program that Tracy um, is doing. It's called the CEO program. It's the, the Community Entrepreneurial Outreach Program. And, you know, a lot of people in our community, especially people that have been incarcerated, once they come out of jail, there's not a lot of possibilities. But they have brilliant minds. They're creative thinkers to be, to get, and do things, you have to be a creative thinker. And so those are the people that we are helping to try to start legitimate businesses. And uh, it's been quite successful and, and folks are, are, are growing and, and, um, and they're reaching their potential. They're, they're, they're reaching goals that they thought that they could never achieve. And that's, that's really cool to actually see that happen. Next, please. And these are just some of the people that, uh, you know, we're not doing this all alone. Yes, our, our building is not done, but we're still doing programming. And so we have, you know, the Mon Valley Providers Council, the Kiwanis, um, you know, various, you know, um, partnerships with Chatham University, um, you know, Rivers of Steel, and, and it's just like, we're just growing. And, um, you know, Commonplace Coffee is, an, is a new one that we just, uh, we partnered with uh, TJ. And he's going to help us in the, in the coffee business. We don't have a full understanding of that business, but he's going to give us everything we need to be successful. And so that's, it's just a great, it's a great thing. And um, so next, please. Um, I just wanted to, you know, thank you guys for having us and, and having the opportunity to share what Seek Clear is about. Um, you can visit our website um, for more information. Uh, the information should be in the chat. Um, but uh, please check us out. Uh, we're in need of uh, volunteers. We're in need of financial support. And, and we're doing this project on our own debt free. Uh, we're, we're writing grants, but we're, we're not trying to get loans and, and to go into debt. That's not what we're doing. We want to be free so we can run. So I just thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Curtis. Oh, you're Thank welcome. You, Lloyd and Tammy. Thank you all so much. I'm Suzanne Donsky. I'm a volunteer um, with the Bell of Homestead Foundation. And we'd like to take a few minutes and pose some questions to our speakers. If you want to take a second, put your question in the chat, and then we can um, present them to you. Uh, Tammy, I'd like to start with you while other people are, are typing their questions. One of the questions that's arisen is whether you got to talk to people who had actually witnessed the demolition or the destruction uh, of all the homes. Were you uh, able to? I have uh, spoken to some older friends of mine who were children when it happened. Um, one of whom I, I think is on right now, so I hope she's listening to this. Um, so, you know, they were able to give me some impressions. Um, 
but you know, from a, from a child's perspective, this happened 80 years ago. Um, I also looked at a number of oral histories that were taken of people, some in the 70s, some in the 80s and early 90s. A couple of those quotes that you saw that I didn't read out loud, but I had on the screen along with some of the images of the word came from those oral histories. Um, again, they're mostly from people who were younger when it happened, maybe more like teenagers. What I wasn't able to really find were primary source oral history accounts from, you know, fathers, mothers from that time, because people didn't really take an interest in documenting that until it was a little bit too late to get those voices. I will note that there was an incredible amount of interest in the press about what was going on. I didn't have time to mention it during my formal talk, but the Pittsburgh Press, as well as the Courier, which is the Black community newspaper in Pittsburgh, they both published a number of human interest stories with a lot of profiles of individuals talking about what their experiences were, losing their stores, looking for housing, where are they going to go, you know, so although I didn't end up including a lot of those voices on account of time, um, those are probably the best document that we have in terms of understanding people's individual stories. Um, you know, the people who are left today are, are, are children who have impressions, um, but probably it lacks, um, you know, a real sense of some of the stakes of, of what was going on that really only an adult could, could appreciate. Thank you. And, and for Lloyd, um, someone has asked, do you know whether the schools are teaching about the destruction of the demolition of the, mill, of the homes for the mill expansion? I, I don't know. Um, you know, perhaps if someone like Mark Fallon happens to be on right now or anyone else from the school district wants to leave a note in the chat. Um, I don't know. I mean, to the extent to which it is included in part of Homestead's history, it's this sort of like rah rah patriotic. We expanded the steel mill and won the war. And although you know, I didn't I didn't really hammer it home in my talk. I hope one of the things that's clear from the timeline is that most of this happened before Pearl Harbor. So while very quickly people, even people living through it, kind of revised their experiences to say we did this because of the war, we did this because of Hitler. Um, that you know, at the time, the United States wasn't actually in the war. Um, and, you know, you'd have to read a lot of other material to get a sense of how inevitable people thought that it was going to be that they would join. Um, but it was really more of a defense effort that they were, were, were part of. And only towards the very end did it become about an act of war. And like I said, that's when everybody who'd been really recalcitrant on the housing front finally figured out that they had to get over themselves and find homes for people. Yeah. Um... Someone has asked, how did Tammy hear about this destruction in the first place? Ah, um, so as I mentioned very briefly, my family is from Homestead and a number of my family members were living in the ward when it was destroyed. I didn't hear about this from my own family. Um, actually, what happened was when I first started doing some family history research, probably about 15 years ago, I discovered, you know, the addresses of where they lived in Homestead. And I typed it into an early version of Google Maps that mapped their addresses directly on the train tracks. And, you know, I didn't think they lived really nice lives as recent immigrants, but I didn't think they lived on the train tracks either. And so I kind of used Google Street View to like check out what was going on. And I could not make heads or tails out of why these addresses, where were they were, because I couldn't find anything residential. I don't know exactly when it was that I came to understand that it had been destroyed. I don't know if that was like 10 years ago or seven years ago when I first really embarked on my research in earnest. But that story has always captivated me because we all, those of us who live in this area, we all know this landscape. And mm -hmm. the landscape does not tell all of its stories. And I'm not originally from here, and I'm always surprised how few people who are from here simply don't know. Even people who kind of grew up, they saw the steel mill there, they remember it being pulled down. They didn't know that that was actually, you know, a later chapter in the history of that land. Um, so yeah, it came out of my own personal family experience. And there's a lot of stories that I could say about what that personal family experience was going through that destruction and what they're, you know, what they experienced and what, where they went to next. But I, I really feel like it's more than anything, the story of an entire community that, you know, sacrificed together, made choices together, were forced to do things together. And if anything, now that I understand the bigger story, it makes it much more interesting to understand what my own family were in the middle of at that time. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Charlie McAllister, I believe you have a question for Tammy.
Are you muted? Hang on, he's unmuting. <laughs> Can you do it? Press right. the space bar, Charlie. Weird. Okay. Uh, first of all, I mean, just thanks to Lloyd and, and Curtis. They were just, just terrific. And Tammy, you're magnificent. But uh, my question was about the Rusin Hall, which when uh, Russ Gibbons and I were meeting with Park Corporation in early, uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, and obviously wanting to save the pump house. That was our purpose there. And also resisting their uh, idea of calling it Pinkerton Landing. Um, <laughs> and we insisted on Battle of Homestead, which was a little more objective. Uh, the the Rusin Hall, I've discovered about the Rusin Hall, which I was very interested in, having done a lot of work on Byzantine history and Byzantine Catholicism. If Peter Oresic had been around in those days, we would have had, I would have known how to organize to save it. But do you know what happened to it or do you know any of its history? You know, I know more about it from, from you, I have to say. <laughs> I, I, I do know. I mean, you told me years ago and I came across it in my own, you know, research for this talk that, right, it was the one old building that was kept and used as an administrative yeah. office. Um, I know that there were... It's like a fossil. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, that's, that's one of the things that... Um, you know, you can, you know, I, I sort of, I understand a, enough about what, you know, to, to Lloyd's point and your point, you know, people were up against when the park corporation was redeveloping it and the fact that anything was saved, but that building really would have been something really remarkable. Yeah. And if it were there, it would really be that thing that the landscape is missing to say, this is the community that was here. And, you know, in this building is a testament to their values. You know, it is it is what it is. Um, yeah. But um, I just, you know, I appreciate your bringing that up. I, I was one of many things I left on the cutting room floor that I did no, not. And all the pictures I kept looking for that little building. I, I remember it. I, yeah, I do. I do have it. Um, I, the truth is, all those photographs of when um, towards the end of like when it was everything was raised except for a few buildings. I also kept looking to see, is this the Rosen Hall? I'm not sure. Anyway, you and I can go back over this photograph. Okay. <laughs> yes, no, I wasn't sure and I had to move on. <laughs> Thank Park, you, Charlie. Park Corporation, Park Corporation took particular hurry in tearing that down so yeah. that there wouldn't be a space in the middle of the waterfront that they couldn't develop. There you go. Inside information. Thank you. <laughs> and Lloyd, do you know if they're teaching in the school about the uh, destruction, the demolition? Uh, it's up to the individual history teachers what they present. Uh, when Mark Fallon was teaching history there, it obviously was a big part of his lesson plans. Sure. But each teacher makes their own lesson plans. Unfortunately, this isn't in, in any of the history books that are in the schools. Okay. And um, for you, Curtis, someone has asked if there were any similar sorts of, of um, actions happening in McKeesport, Braddock, Duquesne. Um, I'm not sure what you what you mean by it. What do you mean by similar actions? The disper Well, this was the question: Were there similar experiences that happened in McKeesport, Braddock, Duquesne? The the, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Um, I when I was growing up, I my parents, like I said, they owned a store right across from Talbot Towers, and I seen that uh, place come down basically to build that hydrogen plant, and they had something called the Sanders Dissent Decree, I believe, and basically these people were dispersed all over the county. And uh, so for them to build that hydrogen plant. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I experienced, I actually have photographs because I was a young photojournalist at that time when they were tearing that down. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it's happening again at, at, at Hawkins Village. Mm. So, you know, go figure. The, the Sanders consent decree was rather interesting. It was named after two women from Talbot Towers right. that um, rejected the county just tearing buildings down. 
and uh, judge, federal judge, I believe it was Judge Diamond, decided that they couldn't locate any more poor families slash black families into neighborhoods that already had more poverty than the national poverty line. And they redlined seven communities and said no more poor people would be located there until the average of four in all the communities in the county rose up to be the same. And that was immediately ignored. And, uh, you know, and I know of no instance at all where it was affected. You know, the same. Uh, and, and, I, and I know Cheryl Saunders, who were yeah, one of the women, one of the women that were on that particular um, thing, and she never got a house. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. They, they made they made sure that she never got a house. That was kind of interesting. <laughs> oh, Tammy, good. did you want to add something? Yeah, I can add a couple historical examples. Um, I only spoke about Homestead because the talk was about Homestead, um, but actually a, a similar thing was happening on a smaller scale in Duquesne at the same time. Um, U.S. Steel was expanding its Homestead works as well as its works in Duquesne. And so same situation there, it actually played out quite differently in some ways. Uh, Duquesne had a much larger black community, so politicians there were looking out for their interests much more. Um, Homestead did a better job of looking out for low-income people. There's some interesting comparisons, but Duquesne was, was going through the same thing at the same time. Um, I know Braddock lost um, part of its uh, lower part of its community um, where the synagogue is now is right outside of the mill gates of Edgar Thompson. And you can be sure when they originally built that synagogue, it was not outside of the mill gates. Mm -hmm. So it gives, you, it gives you a sense of what that expansion was. I don't know the exact date for that. Um, one of the things that I would love to be able to put together as an offshoot of this talk is sort of understanding all of the different places where what happened in the ward inspired copycat kinds of projects, because the word certainly set a template for how you can expand an industry in this region and, and how you kind of deal with all of the challenges and, and get through. Um, because certainly, although it was challenging, they were successful in transplanting people and therefore they copied it and did it again and again. And obviously I'm just talking about industrial projects right now. They do that as well for other areas, but that's, I think, a separate set of, set of issues. Yes. U.S. Steel's current saber rattling and uh, bringing back retired people to the Edgar Thompson Works in Braddock instead of hiring new people and offering buyouts is very similar to what happened to Homestead in the 80s. So I would not be surprised if the same scenario is going to befall the Edgar Thompson Works as befell Homestead Works. Yeah, and I'm looking at that. Someone just noticed, noted that um, Tube City Works in McKeesport did a similar thing where they threatened to leave unless McKeesport gave up the first ward. So there's a, another example of exactly the, the same kinds of things I was talking about with Homestead. Well, I really hate to have to leave it here because there's, there's so much discussion to be had but we, we need to uh, keep to our plan. So I'm going to ask uh, John Hare, the president of the Battle of Homestead Foundation, if he can wrap it up for us. Uh, thank you, uh, Suzanne and Lloyd and Curtis. Uh, this is a wonderful presentation and um, I really feel in my veins, we are talking people's history and it's wonderful to have the pictures, the archives that we can use to, to have the detail and the direct experience that uh, you, are, you have conveyed to us. And also for us to realize that um, as, you, as you summarized, Tammy, uh, that history repeats itself uh, and it's important for us to absorb it, to know it, and uh, to make our way forward with that knowledge. Uh, it doesn't have to repeat itself. So um, it's, it's, it's really been, uh, to my mind, a, a very important uh, session that we've had tonight. And I'm, I'm really happy that we're able to record it. And um, this is a really important resource for future uh, learning about these events. And um, Tammy, I, I can't thank you enough for creating it. And um, 
I, I do believe we are we are really bringing the history to to uh, uh, those who are interested, and they're learning from the history and using it today. So uh, thank you so much. It's it was really really fascinating, and. Um, for those of you that want to continue the discussion and the planning and the programming, uh, you've seen on the chat the listing of the next two uh, programs that we are having this year. Uh, just to reiterate, the first uh, that will happen next is uh, Thursday, July the 15th, Union and Protest Songs, Their History and How to Use Them Today. And for those of you that have never heard of the labor choir, we now have a labor choir in Pittsburgh. And uh, uh, Ted Everhart is going to lead our discussion and demonstration of union and protest songs. We know you'll like it. And uh, the next program is in August and uh, it is about the Battle of Blair Mountain. Um, we saw a lot about the massacre in Tulsa uh, in recent news. And um, Charlie reminded us uh, the other day that uh, the centennial of Tulsa happened maybe 50 days before the Battle of Blair Mountain. And looked at together, these two events, understanding them will give us both sides of the coin of working people's lives, how they lived, how they suffered. Uh, certainly when the working people are, are predominantly one race, uh, it might have a little different slant, but we still have uh, this, the, the uh, suppression of efforts to accrue wealth uh, uh, in, in the black community, the suppression in a number of ways. Uh, and it's important to remember that those folks were working people as well, and their lives and their their homes were destroyed. Um, and in the meantime, on the other hand, we're going to have the Blair Mountain Centennial, uh, where a pitched battle ensued between miners that um, couldn't unionize and were tired of the uh, the henchmen of the of the coal companies, and um, uh, it was one of the few times in an internal dispute that bombs were act actually dropped on striking workers. <laughs> uh, there's a lot to learn about the Blair Mountain, and uh, we're happy to participate with the Mine Wars Museum in Matewan, uh, uh, West Virginia. And uh, in fact, uh, during the presentation on August 19th, we will hear from uh, all the interpreters of, of, of Blair Mountain, the historians. And we're really pleased to be able to do this in conjunction with the Mine Wars Museum. Uh, and uh, just a quick hint to folks, uh, we're talking about maybe uh, partnering, uh, if we can, with uh, DeBolt uh, Unlimited and uh, seeing if folks would like to take a bus down to, uh, uh, during Labor Day weekend to the celebrations and uh, commemorations of the, of the Blair Mountain Massacre. So those are happening, they're exciting. In addition, um, there was a, in the chat a question about, are we still, or when are we ever gonna have our breakfast live again? And uh, we're talking about it now. Uh, uh, when would be an appropriate time? We're thinking that um, in late July, we should begin some investigations about how we can do that. We want to do it. Um, we also recognize that there are some things that we can do on Zoom online that we can't do uh, in person that are valuable. So we're, we're potentially looking at maybe having um, one Zoom event, a breakfast or a dessert a month, and perhaps a live breakfast or two uh, as well. And all that information, uh, folks, you can get uh, on our website, which soon will appear uh, in a different way to you, but the same, uh, same call letters and, and uh, URL. Uh, and uh, we hope that you will uh, come to the website, sign up for information, 
and find out if you'd like to attend our meetups, our breakfasts and, uh, and desserts when we talk about all these issues and what's going on and who can help and who can volunteer, um, you can participate too. And you can do that, uh, go to the website and maybe think you might like to be a member. We'd like to have you. Uh, we're growing and um, we, we, uh, we're, we're really proud of the community that we're hoping to build. So uh, thank you very much to, uh, uh, again, to, to Tammy and to Lloyd and to Curtis and thank you for participating tonight, folks. And we'll see you again. Uh, in the meantime, uh, solidarity forever. Thank you.